show episode 157 sponsored by taylor freelance rainier ballistics hodgson powders and jpl precision hi it's rick again on power factor you know it's rick because of course he's wearing this shirt right right okay uh, the topic of this little tip is ammo gauging if you do any hand loading, uh, the rounds that come out of your press may or may not be as consistent dimensionally as they could be or as they should be. And one of the things you can do in advance, say, of going to a major match or even a local match, depending on the confidence in your loading ability, is to gauge your ammo. And the market supports your efforts by creating these case gauges. This one is, I think, a Wilson brand. It is, oh no, Midway. This is a Midway 45. This is a Midway 9mm. And essentially, it, it, although it looks sort of like, if you look in there, it looks sort of like the inside of the chamber of your gun. It's actually a bit tighter than that. It's uh, made to minimum, in my experience, these especially, these Midway brand ones, are made to minimum dimensions, maybe t probably tighter than any actual chamber you're going to see. And so it, uh, the way it works is the overall length of the gauge is equivalent to the maximum length of the cartridge. So the max length for a 45 ACP cartridge is 1.275 inches. So this gauge is 1.275 inches long. So after you've dropped around into it, you can just kind of look or feel for the end. And if the bullet is not sticking out, then it's within maximum length. Now, I rarely have ever loaded any rounds to max length. Um, my, for round nose bullets, I'm usually, uh, even flat nose bullets, 1.25 to 1.26. Uh, maybe 1.265, um, but this will tell you if your round is over max. If it's over max, it probably won't even fit in the magazine, let alone won't fit in the chamber. So you get your overall length there. It also uh, measures, the, to an extent, the case length. You've got a little shoulder in there like you do at the end of the chamber, and if the round sticks out, that means your case is too long. It could also mean that the round is not dropping fully into the gauge because it's either out of round, there's a bulge in it, or in some cases the rim has been pounded out of round to the extent that it won't drop in here flush. Um, 45 ACP cases especially can be loaded uh, 15, 20, 30 times. Um, essentially you load them until they crack. And so I have 45 auto cases. They've been loaded so many times that you can't even read the head stamp. It's just a sea of scratches and dings and dents. Um, and sometimes the edges of the rim will get pounded out to the extent that the, uh, the max diameter of the rim has been exceeded. All cases have a max, rim, max and minimum rim diameter, and the extractor is designed to operate within that range. If it gets pounded out too big, now you're asking the extractor to do extra duty. And if it's in the form of a bird or some sharp edge, it might actually catch on the extractor and prevent feeding or extraction or ejection. And so the rim is actually uh, an important consideration. And on this particular gauge, the rim will fit down flush um, if the cartridge is fully within specification. So if it doesn't fit flush, let's say you've got this thing sitting on the bench and you drop around in there and it doesn't drop all the way down, it could be a number of things that are, that are causing it not to drop in. It could be the overall length is too long. It could be the case length is too long. It could be you've got an issue with a bulge in the case uh, or, or a, a damaged rim. So if the round doesn't drop in there, you've got to kind of investigate what the issue is. Now, normally when I'm hand loading ammo, I will spot check the rounds. And so what I'll generally do is after, this is not a full box, but after I get them in the box, I will, to kind of simulate randomness, I'll just pick out 
um, a, round, a round, usually I'll start in this lower corner and I'll check is it flush here, is it flush here, and does it just drop freely in and out? And this one does. And then I'll just kind of, it's not really random, I'll just kind of go in a pattern like this. So it sort of simulates random because these rounds were not loaded. You, you don't want to, because something could become unadjusted while you're loading, um, you could have, say, the first 40 rounds are all perfect. And then if something kind of came out of adjustment, the last five or 10, could that, that could be where the problem is. Since they come randomly out of the catch box that's attached to the press and go into here, I can't say, okay, this is the first one I loaded and this is the last one I loaded. They go in here randomly. So if I test a fair number of them, I should catch any kind of chronic problems that are a result of uh, unadjustment or some problem that I've uh, run into with the press. And so doing just kind of a spot check, um, I check maybe 10%. I'll see this one, it goes in and then it doesn't quite want to drop out. It just sticks a little bit. And that could be, um, again, it could be an improper crimp. It's not crimped uh, tightly enough. Uh, there's a bulge in the case. Either the bullet has been seated at a slightly cockeyed angle, which could cause a bulge up here. The case was bulged um, excessively the last time it was fired. And so when it was resized, because the sizing die doesn't go all the way to the bottom of the case, you can actually see, or I can see, uh, the case is shiny up here and then it's a little bit duller at the bottom and that dull area is the part that does not get resized. The, the sizing die has kind of a, a belled shape at it to help funnel the case in and so it does not go all, typically resizing dies do not go all the way to the bottom. So if you have a little bit of a bulge at the bottom here that the sizing die didn't iron out, um, that could prevent it from seating flush. Uh, the rim could have uh, a burr on it or something. And so what I'll generally do is just do a little visible inspection. I don't see any uh, evidence of a bulge up at the top. I don't see any evidence of a bulge near the bottom. So I'm thinking maybe it's the rim. And one of the things you can do to kind of iron out any little imperfections in the rim is to put it in the case gauge backwards and give it a couple of turns like this. And generally when you pull it out, if you closely inspect it, you'll see a little shiny spot, maybe here and there on the edge of the rim, where uh, you've kind of flattened out or smoothed out a little burr. And now uh, let's see. Oh, huh, look at that, now it drops right out. So I won't, sp well, it did drop right out. Anyway, I don't spend a huge amount of time on this. If, if a round really does not wanna go in and really does not wanna drop out, I'll set it aside and we'll call that a practice round. I won't use that at the match. So we'll just go to the next one, looking good. Oh yeah, looking good. And so I'll just kind of go a zigzag pattern here and I'll maybe check um, 10 rounds out of every 50 that I've loaded. And uh, this gauge, like I said, is really tight. I mean, I have had rounds, maybe 1% uh, of the rounds that I load will not, just won't work. I mean, either the, the rim is too beat up, there's some other issue. And then uh, what I have found though, is if I take an actual gun barrel um, and drop the rounds in there. That's another test. Even if you don't have one of these gauges, you can do what's called, what is uh, sometimes referred to as a plunk test, where you take your loaded round, and if it plunks into the barrel and then drops back out, you're probably not gonna have an issue. Any rounds that I, virtually every round that I've loaded that does not drop in or out of this gauge smoothly that I set aside as a practice round, it's still passes the plunk test. So that's why I say that the dimensions of these case gauges is often um, tighter than even the chamber of your barrel. And so if you're using this as a gauge, um, you'll certainly be able to chamber those rounds in the barrel. And if you don't have a gauge, you wanna just use your barrel, just pull it out of the gun and uh, you can do the plunk test, drops in, drops out. You can check the overall length um, by looking to see if the rim is, uh, flush with the barrel hood. And if it's flush and drops in and drops out, that's just about as good as a uh, case gauge. So for those of you who uh, are using Dillon presses, um, particularly the SL900 or the Dillon 550 or 650 or the 1050 and are reloading uh, large capacity rifle shells, 
you probably know is that you're frequently running out of powder. Um, and I've mentioned before on using the SL900 that I probably load about 150 rounds or so before running out of powder. Um, I recently had the experience of actually depleting the amount of powder that was in the powder reservoir and didn't realize it until I loaded about 10 shells and had to go back through my uh, bucket of shells and try to identify which one. So to prevent that from happening, um, the standard powder hopper that Dylan provides with all the presses is about seven inches in length. And the folks at Unique Tech make a aftermarket product um, that increases the powder hopper capacity dramatically. On uh, my particular press here, um, they, they make two different sizes, one that is 11 inches and one that is 14 inches, and this one here is 11 inches, and I primarily went with the 11-inch one because of the proximity to the case feeder. I didn't want it going above the case feeder, and it also um, would just make loading the, the powder hopper difficult. I was afraid that I might end up interfering with the case feeder. Um, on the bottom of the powder hopper, as it comes from the factory, there's a baffle in here. The powder hopper from uh, Unique Tech is just simply a, a you know a, a sleeve here, but they provide a a baffle uh, internal to it that you place in there, and it basically serves the same purpose as this. So, for those of you who um, who are using this, I would highly recommend that if you want to increase the powder capacity uh, of your Dillon press, to go to Unique Tech and um, and see what they have. The other thing I wanted to mention here is that one of our viewers, um, Christopher St. Clair, talked about a aftermarket, um, or I shouldn't say aftermarket, an upgrade that he made to his SL900, and it primarily is the, the drop ramp here on the press. Um, what he pointed out, and I found also, is that if you take the, the shot shell bucket here off, this thing would fall off and clank and make a lot of noise. So what he did, is he took a piece of um, basically vacuum line hose and slid it, about quarter inch vacuum line hose, and slid it and fit it around the, um, the opening here of the drop ramp. And after doing that, it nicely fits up here now against the press and stays in place and doesn't fall out. So you can actually take the powder bucket or the shot bucket here away, or I should say the shell bucket here away, and store it um, elsewhere but not have to worry about this thing falling off or doing anything like that so hope that helps you guys out hi i'm larry and uh, this is going to be the first in a series of uh, start position demonstrations and discussions um, we've had some questions over email and on uh, forums where we announce our shows, every time our show comes out on Mondays, you know, there's a bunch of different forums that we announce the, the, uh, the arrival, the posting of a new show. And we've had some questions uh, from our viewers about start positions. And uh, this can be IDPA, this can be USPSA um, related um, as we go through. Today I'm, I'm really thinking about USPSA when I'm talking about this stuff. But... Uh, We'll start with the basics um, of, the, of the, the, the two most basic start positions that there are, and that is, uh, first of all, facing downrange. Now, what is facing downrange? Well, if you can kind of see my feet here, let's just say that this is the, this is the 180 line, uh, and I am facing, let's say you're standing at the targets and I'm facing the targets here, uh, I'm facing directly downrange right now. So... Um, is downrange defined in the book? Actually, the answer is no, so far anyway. Um, currently, in the rule book, there is no real definition of facing downrange. So I could stand at the start position in the start box or whatever, just hands relaxed at sides. This is the, the normal start position. Um, uh, there, there's nothing that says that I can't stand to the side, however. So um, if, if my very first target is over to my left, there's nothing that says I can't start facing that target. I'm not facing uprange. And so to, to figure out or to, to really dis, to, to discuss what is downrange, you have to first define what is uprange. And in the um, 2000... 10 version of the rule book in the glossary we will see uh, 
Where is it? <laughs> I should have prepared. Facing up range. Here we go. Facing up range. F facing up range is defined as face, feet, face and feet pointing straight up range with shoulders parallel to the backstop. So this assumes the backstop is parallel to the 180 and your shoulders are parallel to that. So, um, so what is facing down range? Well, like I said, it's just not facing up range. So, um, I, you know, I can't break the 180 with my gun, right? So therefore facing up range would be like 181. You know, I'm just one degree past the 180. That would be up range or rather not down range because I can't point my gun there. So therefore I must not be down range. But if I come back two degrees and now I'm at, at you know, one degree inside of the 180, I must be down range. And so, um, for for the newer shooters out there, when you're, when you're gaming, if you will, your start position, you don't have to stand, you know, absolutely naturally erect like this, um, facing straight down range. If your first target is here, and then you have to do some running after that, so um, consider that when you're um, starting off your uh, when you when you're getting set up for your stage. Now sometimes they'll have like your toes have to be on the X's and on this board, and the board is. Uh, you know, maybe you're starting outside the fault lines and, and there's X's on the fault lines. Well, you can still, you can still turn yourself this direction if that's your first target that you're going to engage and, and still have your toes, both toes touching those marks. So it's just something to think about there. Now, um, simply facing up range, um, I don't know if I'm going to turn my back to you, but let's just say that, you know, Facing uprange, like I said, is defined as squarely uprange. So I have my feet, my, it says shoulders, but by definition now my hips are also going to be uh, parallel to the backstop and my face has to be uprange as well. So that means, let's say on an El Presidente drill, which is your turn and draw start, hands up, none of this. This is not facing up range. Uh, you can't, you cannot have your head cocked around, kind of half ready to go, um, facing up range. So that's now defined as of the 2010 rule book, which is the latest and greatest. Um, uh, I think they're making some revisions to it now, so we might see a new rule book next year. But for now, anyway, that's that's what it says: squarely feet, shoulders, head, squarely up range. So. Um, to finish out this uh, somewhat of a short segment, one of our viewers asked about um, how should I turn and draw? Um, he says that uh, at, at a match he turned one way or the other and um, he was told he did it wrong. So let's see, um, let's see what that looks like. Um, so first of all, I'm at Glock 35 here. Let's show it's clear. Pull trigger, and um, so let's say now you're the you're the range officer, and I am now facing up range. The targets are behind me, um, so I've made ready. I turn around, assume the start position. Let's say my hands are up. Hands could be up or down, whatever. But if I were to now, if, if I'm to draw the gun now, of course you're not going to draw the gun this direction. But now let's say I'm pointing parallel to the berm, and I'm perpendicular to the the fault line so if I turn 90 degrees I'm right on the 180 and if I turn 91 degrees I'm I'm safe right legally I've done nothing wrong now let's say I'm pointing from here I'm gonna turn to the right 90 degrees and I'm on the line 91 degrees and I'm safely downrange I've done nothing wrong technically I've done nothing wrong but there's two different techniques there um, Generally, you're going to, as you start off as a new shooter, you're going to have people tell you to turn into the gun. And what that means is, if the gun's on this side and I'm facing up range, targets are behind me, what that means is to turn and, and put the gun towards the down range instead of put the gun towards the up range. So that would look something like this. I'm, I'm facing up range, hands above shoulders, and... On the beat, I turn and draw to the targets. Now, how far did I turn around? 
180 degrees. If I'm going to shoot the target right here, straight down range, I turned 180. Now, what about if I did it this way? I turned 180 degrees. So is there, is there a, a, a measurable difference? I actually don't think so. Um, I've been running some drills and timing uh, myself with the par time with, um, I don't know, whatever the time is, but the second beep, I can turn... I can turn this way, I can turn that way, and pretty much accomplish what I'm trying to accomplish, which is getting my, my, my sights on target um, in the same amount of time. So, But now, why would you choose one over the other, one direction over the other? Um, this, this viewer that I'm telling you about, he turned, he turned this direction and drew the gun like that, and somebody told him he did it wrong, and he was confused, what's wrong? Was it illegal? Did I, do, did I break some rule? Did I do something unsafe? And as I've just shown you, uh, you're not doing anything unsafe. You turn 91 degrees, and now I'm downrange. If I turn 91 degrees this way, I'm also pointing downrange. So two different things that um, uh, would make my decision on this. Now, if I had to turn... And the first target that I had to engage was off to my left, my gun being on the right, I would turn that direction. I mean, why, why would you go 270 degrees almost to find that target? So that's one reason why you might choose to turn left versus right. Same thing, if there was my first target was here over on the right, I would turn towards that target. Now, in, in a standard drill like the El Presidente, where you turn 180 degrees and the targets are straight down range, why would you pick one over the other? Well, in my experience so far, anyway, in, in, my, in my measuring the time, like I said, it's, it's, um, it's not really measurable in, in, in terms of time. So, um, but I will recommend that you turn into the gun, turn, the, turn to the right if you're right-handed shooter, and that would look like this again. And what's the reason for that? Well... My reasoning for that is that as the gun clears the holster, that, ho that you cannot have the gun, you cannot have the trigger accessible if you're facing uprange. Now remember, uprange is uprange of the 180 line of the fault line. Downrange is downrange of the fault line, and that that's separated by one degree. Now, how are we measuring that with our mind? I mean, it's it's, it's a little bit subjective in these guys that uh, turn fast and draw fast. But, again, if I turn 91 degrees before I clear the gun and I'm still turning towards those targets versus if I turn 91 degrees this way and I clear the holster as I'm still turning toward the targets, technically, both are the same. I'm turning 180 degrees before I am pointing at those targets. The reason I'm going to... I'm going to tell you that it's best to turn into the gun, right-handers turn and right, is that the RO, you're putting yourself between the RO and the gun. So now the RO can't quite see what's happening and when the gun comes out of the holster. Technically, I've done nothing wrong. I'm not telling you to clear the, I'm not telling you to clear the holster uh, early, but you're you're setting yourself up for a bad call if you do this now the the gun is between you and the RO and while that is technically not wrong i turned way more than 90 degrees before i cleared but the RO maybe he's not ready for you to turn that way because it's really not normal it's not normal for people to turn away from the gun, normally the gun comes out this way. Um, in my opinion, you would, you would set yourself up for a, a bad call if the RO wasn't quite paying attention, if he wasn't quite ready um, for you to do what you just did, and maybe he thought he saw something that didn't really happen, and now you got yourself uh, a DQ, you're facing a DQ possibly um, for for something that you didn't do wrong. Maybe he just um, wasn't quite ready and wasn't paying attention. So uh, my tip of the week is uh, all else being equal, target straight down range, 
turn into the gun and um, you'll find that um, neither is any slower but um, and the main thing is um, get your eyes on the target that's um, that's that's probably the best tip right there um, to to accomplishing this this maneuver this uprange start position to turning toward the targets um, you can overthink this for sure you want to you know, what do I do with my feet? Do I step first with my right? Do I want to step first, you know, does, does my right foot go back and my left foot come around? Do I start and have the left foot just come around the right foot? You can totally overthink the start position. The best thing to do is, and it's usually hands above shoulders, I like to index my, my hands on my glasses or on the, on my, uh, the brim of my ball cap and the first thing you want to do when you hear that beep is get your eyes on the target. The rest of your body will follow and the feet will take care of themselves. So, I mean, that just looks something like this. So, what did I do with my feet? Honestly, I don't know. I think I pivoted around on my right foot. It doesn't really matter. Uh, as long as you stay in the three foot box, which is plenty of room to do it, uh, you'll find that. Uh, it's not that difficult of a start position. So um, hopefully you enjoyed the tip of the week, and uh, we'll see you next week.